So yeah, I work for Amazon, but most of this stuff is stuff that I finished before joining Amazon. I'm working on different stuff now. And when Alessandra and, and Prakash and Nat asked me to talk about automata learning uh, for the summer school, it was a bit tricky because there's a lot of stuff uh, in, in, in automata learning. So obviously what I'll do is just uh, talk about a few topics, my personal selection, mostly based on, I guess, like what I already had slides on. <laughs> uh, no shame in admitting that. Um, but I'll, I, I want to put this into context. So one thing that I find fascinating about automata learning is that in, in the same way that uh, automata and language theory have been there since the beginning of like computer science and theoretical computer science, automata learning has been there since the beginning of, of learning theory. And this is something that Probably like, like the mainstream people in machine learning, they, they don't know about it these days because this is like goes, goes back to the late 60s and early 70s. Um, but there, there are a lot of like the first, uh, like say, theoretical learning results uh, were actually about automata uh, or, or most of them. So the first thing that you can find in the literature is this result by Gold on 67 where, I mean, uh, he showed that you can learn regular languages in the limit. And in the limit is one way of formalizing learning. It's not one that is used today because it's kind of very, uh, it's very unrealistic, but it was one of the first results on, on learning theory. Then uh, Angloin refined this and in, in 67. Uh, by the way, Angloin is, is, Gold's not active anymore, but Angloin still, is still active. She's still teaching at Yale. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know, if you ever visit there, like get in touch with her if you're interested in this stuff. She's, she's an amazing person. Um, so so she, saw, she showed that regular languages can also be learned in a, in a different setting, uh, learning from queries, membership and, and uh, equivalence queries. And I think Ben was supposed to talk about this in his like uh, computational learning theory, but maybe he didn't make it. Did you see Anglin's algorithm? No. no. Okay. Well, I, I, unfortunately, I, because Ben told me he was going to do it, uh, I didn't include it. Um, but, but it's fine. Like it, it kind of like you, you can see where it, where, where it comes from, uh, from some of the stuff I'm going to, I'm going to talk about. So I'll probably make a remark about this. Again, learning from queries, uh, like, uh, is, is somewhat an, a not too realistic, uh, learning model when it comes to learning from data from the real world, but it is more realistic when you're trying to learn with a system that you can interact with. So this is, is getting a slightly more, um, more realistic. But then, like, like in, in, say, the early 90s, like, like uh, learning theory really like, started to blossom, and people proposed more, like, uh, say, realistic uh, models of, of learning, like definitions of what it means to learn and what it means to deal with data that might come from a real world by introducing randomness, for example. And, and in these more realistic models, like pack learning, for example, the first results were kind of negative. So, so in, in the early 90s, in 93, Pitt and Worm showed that pack learning like regular languages or DFA is actually NP-hard, whereas the previous algorithms, you could do it in polynomial time in, those, in these kind of more unrealistic learning models. And then in 94, Kearns and Balian extended this like NP-hardness to also cryptographic hardness. So this was kind of a, of a down and then like the, the machine learning uh, community kind of transitioned to look at other problems because, well, these this automata and regular languages seem to be too hard. But some people, like especially like stubborn people like Clark, the need, like Gera, and Sin and so others, what they did through this period of 20 years is, is say, well, the general problem might be too hard. So they, they went and looked at particular instances, uh, like restrictions of the problem and so on, and using methods from combinatorics that came from these results by Golden Angloin, with some tools in statistics and linear algebra, they managed to make like partial progress. And, and to me, uh, this, this partial progress like, like kind of like is summarized by these 2009 results, which like really like started this field of spectral learning of, of, uh, of automata, which is what I want to talk about today. So what, I, what I'll talk about today are things that started from 2009. So it's kind of a, a modern uh, take on, on automata learning but they're obviously inspired by all this stuff. So what I want to do in this kind of lecture tutorial, I want to motivate these spectral techniques I'm talking about, especially for learning weighted automata and other models on sequences and tree structure data. Um, I'll obviously, like, there's a lot of to cover here, so what I'll focus mainly, mainly is in providing intuitions and fundamental results that, if you're interested in this area, will help you effectively navigate the literature. Uh, we'll survey some of the formal results and, and some of the proofs 
um, but not in, in too much depth. And especially I want to make emphasis on, on the tools that we use to, to uh, analyze these algorithms and, and prove these results, which are linear algebra, concentration bounds from probability, and, and like a few well-known things from learning theory, which probably you've seen in Baron's lecture. What I want to do is dive deep into applications. So there's like uh, lots of applications of these methods. I'll kind of stay at the, at the abstract level, not deal with applications too much. So I'll give pointers to things and, and what, where they can be applied. Um, I cannot obviously provide an exhaustive treatment, so that's beyond the, the, the scope of an introductory lecture. I'll give some pointers at the end in case you want to keep digging. And instead of like trying to give like complete proofs of everything I'll state, I'll, I'll, I'll give a few proofs that kind of illustrate uh, the methods that these linear algebra applications and concentration results and so on. So the plan is I'll start with some sort of like motivating story about like sequential data and, and why weighted automata play a role in learning from sequential data. Uh, I'm pretty sure you've seen sequential data in, in Hado's uh, lecture about reinforcement learning. I'm not sure if like the other uh, lectures on, on Bayesian learning, statistical learning, and computational learning talk too much on sequential data, so I'll, I'll do a brief introduction there. Then I'll talk about like these fundamental results about weighted automata reconstruction and approximation, which are kind of the, the, the main building blocks for analyzing and designing the learning algorithms that I'll, that I'll explain in part three and four, which fall in the pack learning category and statistical learning. So this would correspond to what Ben was talking about, and this is what Barnes was talking about a little bit, the, the setups. And then uh, if I have time, I'll explain a little bit. So this is all for sequential data, how you extend these ideas to learn from uh, transductions, which are sequence to sequence models, and models on other uh, structured data like trees. And yeah, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm happy to take questions along the way, um, clarifications, notation, whatever. Just, uh, just stop me. Okay? Okay, so, well, uh, sequential data. If, if I'm, I'm not sure what the audience here, if you come more from logic, if you come more from learning, but in any case, it's pretty obvious if you think about like learning from real data, that there's a lot of examples where you want to apply machine learning where you'll have sequential data, right? Starting with natural language processing, where you have sequences of words as sentences, sequences of sentences as documents, and so on, uh, to other stuff like computational biology. So when we represent like DNA as sequence of like uh, ACTGs, or when we represent the uh, proteins as sequences of amino acids, like you, you are dealing with sequential data. This is not the only uh, like representation of these data. Sometimes you also have graphs, but it's again structured data. Uh, time series analysis is obviously like a, a type of data that by, by nature is, is ordered in time, so it, it, makes, a sequ it ma makes a sequence. Uh, sequential decision making, like sequences in the name there. And, and, and robotics, so robots that interact with an environment, they see like sequence of observations and have to take a, a sequence of actions. So like sequential data is very important in, in, in these physical systems that, well, I mean, time and physics are, are very interrelated. So what makes this like sequential data kind of special is that most of the times we cannot apply the, the common machine learning algorithms that everyone knows because these uh, algorithms assume that we can represent the data uh, so the inputs as vectors of a fixed size, right? And, and, and that in, in sequences is kind of tricky, right? Because you can have sequences of length 10 or sequences of length 20 or 25. How do you come up with a representation that encodes all these sequences of different lengths as vectors of a fixed size? This is what makes it like very hard, for example, to apply here things like logistic regression, uh, like linear regression, and, and, and many other of like these very basic uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. Of course, if you have something that kernelizes, you can think about kernels over sequences, and there's like a whole lot of literature there. Um, but, but I'm not going to go into there. Uh, what I, what I want to focus on is, is, is on the compositional aspect of sequences. So if you have two sequences, you concatenate them, you get a new sequence. If you have a tree and you append another tree to one of the leaves, you have another tree. So this data that has this compositional structure uh, kind of leads itself very naturally to be analyzed by, by, by the kind of methods that I'll present, which are methods based on like, I mean, at the intuitive level, they use linear algebra to discover latent variables. And, and, and you'll see more about when I, when I go further into the material. Um, and, and also when we talk about sequence data, one thing that is important to realize is that things can, there's a lot of diversity even within, uh, within sequential data, right? The observations in the sequence can be continuous or discrete. And the time at which we observe things could be like continuous time, could be discrete time, or could be like, I don't know, like uh, arbitrary times, and we only know that, well, one, one symbol comes before another. 
So what, what I'll be assuming today in this lecture is that we have sequences uh, represented by w w that have finite uh, have symbols in a finite alphabet sigma star. Okay, so that's the the set of all sequences that I can uh, build using symbols from an alphabet sigma that is finite. And in some of the examples I'll use, it's going to be the simplest alphabet, just letters A and B. But you can think that it's in general, for example, if you're dealing with natural language applications, sigma could be the set of all English words. Um, and, and the goal will be to learn uh, a function from strings to real numbers. Okay, So we'll be given some data. And the goal will be to produce a function that given strings associates to them real numbers. And these real numbers will have some semantics. We'll, like, we'll try to get these numbers to do something that is interesting for our application. So, so there are many things that can be represented like that. For example, a language model. So in a language model, what we have as input to like, this function f is a sentence, a sequence of words. And what we would like to predict, for example, is the likelihood of observing this sentence in a specific, in a specific natural language. So this is used, for example, in applications when you're doing like machine translation. So you have machine translation, so you're translating from, say, um, uh, French to English, and you have a model that might propose like 10 translations for, for a sentence. So then to try to decide like which sentence you pick, one thing that you can take into account is, is how good this, the, these proposals are grammatically, and you can use the language model to score this, because like things that are more grammatical will have higher probability of occurring in the language than things that are non-grammatical. Uh, in the, in the, for example, in the computational biology example, you can have like protein scoring models where you, you give like a protein and code it as a sequence of amino acids and you're trying, for example, to use F to predict what's the activity of this protein for a particular biological reaction. Uh, in the sequence of robotics or sequential decision making or reinforcement learning, you can have, for example, a sequence of actions and you might want to predict what's the expected reward an agent will collect after executing this sequence of actions. And in, for example, in network applications, you can have like a sequence of, of packets in a network and try to determine what's the probability that the sequence of packets will transmit a, a message successfully through the network. So there are just a few examples of applications to motivate that what I'm going to talk next, although it's going to look pretty abstract, you can, you can use it in, in a lot of applied settings. Uh, one important remark here is that this F that I'm trying to learn is like, you, you can actually write it like this, right? Something from sigma star to r is something in r to the sigma star, and that's an infinite, an infinite dimensional object. So if we're trying to learn this thing, we'll have to put data in a computer and get something out from a computer. So we need a way to represent this in a finite way, and this is an infinite dimensional object. And the, here is where weighted automata come in. They provide us with finite representations for uh, objects on this class. And they're obviously not the only finite representations. There can be many different ways of representing that. And I'll, I'll get a little bit into this at the end when we talk about like more complicated stuff that use trees to generate sequences. But for most of the lecture, I'll be dealing with representations of functions from strings to real numbers that are given by a weighted automata. Uh, if you've seen weighted automata before, a disclaimer, I'm just going to use real weights here. So like if you've seen like things about like weighted automata over semi-rings, here I'm just going to use kind of the simplest or, or, or the most basic semi-ring, just the real numbers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. Um, so what's a weighted automaton? Uh, weighted automaton, uh, you can have different ways to look at it. Um, so one way is a graphical representation. So a graphical representation of a weighted automaton basically says we're going to have a number of states, finite number of states, here's the, the finite, uh, which we're usually going to denote n. So here's an example with two states, right? These states are, are these round things. One is named q1 and the other is named q2. <coughs> and we also have an alphabet. As I said before, here I'm going to just use the alphabet AB, so just like uh, some letters. And then what we have is for each state we have initial weights. So the initial weight of q1 is minus 1, indicated like this. The initial weight of Q2 is 0.5. We have also final weights for each state. Here is 1.2 and here is 0. And then for each pair of states and a letter, we have a, weight, a transition weight. So for example, from Q1 to Q2 with letter A, you have weight minus 1. And you have this for every pair of like state, letter, state. So the graphical representation is, is nice because if, if, you, if some person draw this, uh, you, well, I mean, this is kind of a random example, but if, if some person is designing a weighted automata to do something, you can probably like infer what that is trying to do from the graphical representation. 
But what happens when we do machine learning is that the output is just going to be a bunch of numbers. So it's, it's very hard to, to, to interpret these things. So it's actually more convenient to work with a different representation that will uh, help us encode these things in, in the computers and also do algebra with it, which is representing all these weights as vectors and matrices. So what we do is we have like a vector alpha for the initial weights, remember, minus 1, 0 0.5, minus 1, 0 0.5. And the dimension of these vectors correspond to the number of states, right? So two states, two dimensions. Uh, the final weights beta, uh, 1.20, 1.20. And then for each symbol in, in, in our alphabet sigma, in this case we had two symbols, A and B, uh, we're going to have one transition matrix, which is going to be number of states times number of states. And it's going to contain the transition states associated with the, that particular letter. So this minus one here that goes from state one to state two corresponds to the first row here, second row, uh, second column here, the minus one. So this minus one is this minus one here coming from main, and so on. Um, so succinctly, what we will do is we will typically write a weighted automaton as this tuple of initial weights, final weights, and the transition matrices for each symbol in the alphabet. This, if the automaton has n states, which sometimes I'll denote by a bar, size of a, uh, these guys will be n-dimensional vectors and these uh, matrices will be n times n matrices. Okay, so I said we wanted to use a weighted automata to represent functions from strings to real numbers. So here's the function that a weighted automata computes, right? So it's a function that sometimes I'll denote by fa for automaton a. And it takes a string x1 up to xt, does just a sequence of symbols in the alphabet. And what it does, and what like the typical definition that, that somebody used is this kind of cumbersome expression that basically says, you take this string, and for each pair of states, you look whether there's a path in the automaton that connects them that is labeled by this uh, string. So you will find some weights along this, this path. What you need to do is multiply all the weights along this path. So that's this, this product here, right, from like, so you have a sequence of states, there's going to be n of them, uh, there's going to be t of them, and they're going to have to take values between 1 and n. And you have a sequence of weights that you multiply. You multiply also the initial weight and the final weight, and then you sum these for all possible paths. So this is kind of easy to see in the graphical representation, um, but in the algebraic representation you have this more compact expression, where basically you take the vector of initial weights as a, as a row vector, you multiply the sequence of transition uh, weight matrices given by the symbols in your sequence, and then you multiply by the final weight beta. And, and you can see that you can summarize this in alpha transpose AXB. So this is a row vector, this is a matrix, and this is a column vector. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of an inner product type thing. And obviously, uh, we can have uh, functions of this type that are not represented by a weighted automata. So we give the name recognizable or rational to the uh, functions of this type that can be represented by a weighted automaton, right? So we say that f is recognizable or rational if there exists a weighted automaton a that computes this function. And the smallest number of states for which we can achieve this, right, the, 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 the least n for which we can find an automaton that satisfies this, we will denote the rank of the function. And, and you'll see where this notation run comes from in, in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, and so therefore we can also say that if we, we have an automaton, we say that the automaton is minimal if the number of states that it has is the rank of the function it computes. And, and one important observation here is that weighted automaton are not unique. You can have like many weighted automaton that, the automata that compute the same function. So if I have this automaton given by, by this uh, initial transition and final weights, if I take any invertible matrix Q, that is n times n, and I multiply this guy by Q, I conjugate this guy by Q, and I multiply this guy by Q inverse, well, this automaton that I get has different weights, right? I mean, you can argue are the same weights represented in a different basis, but they're different numbers. Uh, but all the queues cancel along the way, so you're, you have like two automata that compute the same thing. So that's going to be important because that's going to mean that if we're trying to learn a weighted automaton and we have a learning algorithm, uh, we cannot insist on getting the same automaton back. All we can insist is on getting an automaton that computes the same function. Okay? So, so that kind of is, is important when you're trying to learn things that are probabilistic objects. Ah, okay. I, I was seeing the hand there, but I wasn't seeing you. Sorry. Uh, 
transformation by inverse domain? Uh, the minimals are, yeah. When you're minimal, you are. Otherwise, things can get slightly trickier, but yeah. There are a few normal forms, um, but usually the only way we can get normal forms out of learning is learning something and transforming it into a normal form. So it's not that useful to design learning algorithms. But yeah, you, you can come up with normal forms as well. OK. Um, so this is kind of, of a very general object, and there are two very classical examples that you might have seen before. Uh, one is deterministic finite automata. So in, in, in a DFA, that is like the object that we use to recognize regular languages, you can easily encode it as a weighted finite automaton, uh, where all the weights are either 0 or 1, and alpha is going to be just an indicator of what is the initial state, beta is just going to have 1s uh, in the coordinates of the states that are accept accepting, and otherwise it will have zeros in the rejecting states. And then the transitions for like symbol sigma i and j will be like one if there is a transition from i to j labeled by sigma and for each like i and sigma there's only going to be one of, of those. Uh, so you can check using my, my previous formulas that if you put something like this, you take a DFA like this, then you, are actu you actually get a function from strings to like zero one that defines a regular language. Um, another well-known example, more from like the, the, the statistics community, are hidden Markov models. Um, so in hidden Markov models, now the weights are going to be like probabilities. So they're going to be like in the interval 0, 1. And alpha is going to be in this case like a distribution over initial states. So alpha is going to be a probability distribution given as a vector. Beta, uh, like there's like some subtlety here, like different definitions. The one that I like is beta is a vector of ones. So um, there's, there's nothing to do in beta. And then the transitions, if you have a symbol sigma, an initial state i, and a final state j, uh, basically the weight is the probability that you go from i to j and observe symbol sigma. And in an HMM, usually we assume that these probabilities are, uh, like the probability of transition and the probability of emission, are conditionally independent given the current state which you can write as this, say that this probability is the probability of going from i to j times the probability of observing a sigma from i. So if you put something like this, you, you get a function from strings to probabilities that defines a dynamical system. So it gives you like probabilities of generating next symbols and so on. Okay, so these are just two examples to put things into context. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so we have to learn these objects. And to learn these objects, we will need to exploit some structural properties. And the easiest way, not the only one, but the easiest way to see these uh, structural properties is to look at the Hankel matrix of the function from strings to real numbers, okay? So that's kind of, a, I mean, if you've never seen this before, it might seem kind of warped up, but uh, at some point it becomes intuitive and you get used to it. So if you have a function from strings to real numbers, it's Hankel matrix that I will denote HF is a real matrix with rows and columns indexed by strings. Okay, so because we have infinitely many strings, this matrix is going to be infinite in principle. And we usually denote the indexes of the rows prefixes and the indexes of the column suffixes. And the reason is because this matrix is defined as follows. So if I have HF, and I have an, a row index, which is going to be a prefix p, and a column index, uh, which is going to be a suffix s. Then the entry in, in the ps coordinate is going to be the function evaluated on the string that I obtain by concatenating p and s. Okay, so that's a new string that has like p as a prefix, s as a suffix, and I'm evaluating f there. So for example, uh, empty concatenated with empty, f on empty. Empty concatenated with a, f on a, and so on. Um, so you see here, for example, that this is kind of a very, very redundant way to represent the function because uh, this function from strings to real numbers is actually contained in, already in the first row of the matrix or in the first column. And actually, if you have a string x of length l, uh, f of x, will you can find it l plus 1 times in this matrix. It's very redundant. But uh, this redundancy gives us something, gives some structure, which is the, the Fliess-Kronecker theorem which says that although this matrix is infinite, 
it can have finite rank, and it tells you exactly when it's going to have finite rank. It's going to have finite rank even only if this function is rational, that is, it can be represented by a weighted automaton, and actually the rank of the matrix is going to be the rank of the function, that is, the minimal number of states that you need to represent this function as a weighted automaton. <laughs> Okay, so this is kind of like, I don't know, the first time I saw this, it was really surprising, Like right? You have this infinite matrix, it has finite rank, and you have like a very, very crisp characterization of when it has finite rank, meaning that you can, well, take this matrix and represent it as something that has like, uh, you know, if the matrix has rank n, you can represent it as something that has roughly n squared numbers, and is an infinite matrix. Uh, rational means that it can be represented by a weighted automaton. Is this, uh, yeah, is this definition that I gave here. Um, so, in particular, it's rational when the Hankel matrix has finite rank. But. Okay, so I'm not going to give the full proof of this, um, but I always try to give an intuition of where this comes from. So, so th then you see, because this intuition is kind of embedded in, in, the, in the machine learning algorithms that we derive from this algorithm, uh, from this theorem, sorry. So, so what's the intuition here? So suppose we actually have a rational function, right? So suppose we have fa that is computed by some weighted automaton a. Uh, if I want to prove the, the kronecker fleece theorem, what I need to show is that well, one, like one of the steps in the proof is to show that if, you ha if you're in this setting, then this matrix cannot have rank larger than the number of states of A. And that is very easy to see. Why? Because you take a prefix P and a suffix S, right, a row and a column in this matrix, and you look at this entry. And this entry is going to be this rational function evaluated on the prefix P and the suffix S. But we know by the definition of what the, the function the automaton computes, that this has this form, right? This is just alpha transpose times uh, the a's corresponding to the symbols in the prefix, times the a's corresponding to the symbols in the suffix, times beta. Now, this is a row vector. If I split it here, this is a row vector and this is a column vector. So it's kind of an inner product, right? And, and the interesting thing, uh, if I call this uh, alpha p and this beta s, like, uh, and usually I call this like a forward vector because it's like moving forward in the automaton and this is a backward vector because it's moving backward in the automaton. Um, so for example, if now I keep P fixed and I change S, right, which means I'm changing like which column I'm looking at, this part will not change, right? So that basically means that anything that is in here, in this row, is gonna be an inner product of this fixed vector with other column vectors. So what I can do is I can fix this orange vector alpha p here, and then look at all these possible column vectors and arrange them in a matrix, right? And have like this, this kind of little row by all these columns gives me this row. And if you do this like for all rows and columns, you see that you've actually like find the factorization of this matrix, this Hankel matrix into this form, like a tall skinny matrix and a, a, a short flat matrix, which I call P of A and S of A. And the intermediate dimension here is the intermediate dimension here, which is N, the number of states, right? The dimension of these vectors, which tells me that because um, I just written this matrix as a product of two matrices that have intermediate dimension N, therefore the rank of this matrix cannot be more than N. Okay, so that's how you prove the upper bound. And these factorizations are going to like, uh, we will going to use them to derive learning algorithms. So we, what we will do basically is start with this Hankel matrix, factorize it, and because these vectors are kind of related to the automaton, try to, from this factorization, go back to the automaton. Uh, so sometimes, I'm not sure I'm going to use this too much in, in this talk, but sometimes we call this factorization the forward vector factorization induced by A of the Hankel matrix. And, and know that like this is infinite and both these are infinites. Okay, uh, questions? No questions, cool. Okay, so, so how do we use this kronecker fleece theorem to build learning algorithms? I kind of gave you the intuition, but let's look at, at this a little bit uh, more in detail. So I just show you that this is kind of like the intuition behind the kronecker fleece theorem, this like forward-backward factorization. 
So now let me do something that at first might look strange. Let me pick an arbitrary symbol from my alphabet and put it here in the middle, right? Between my prefix and my suffix. What's going to happen? What's going to happen in this representation here is that now I'll keep my orange vector and my green vector, but I'll have this uh, red matrix corresponding, yeah, I mean, this should be an A, or this should be a sigma, sorry. Um, right, so, so, so you'll get this red matrix in the middle, which in terms of like a factorization of a matrix, so if I now build this matrix that, I mean, is no longer Hankel, it doesn't satisfy the Hankel constraints, but at each prefix and suffix, I'm going to put the evaluation of the function on concatenating the prefix, the symbol, again, this should be a, a, a sigma, and, and the suffix, then the factorization that I get is the same one that I had, but with the red matrix AA in the middle. So I've just built a system of linear equations that tells me how to find this guy. And the following sense. If I have this factorization, so I, if I have this matrix and a factorization of it, and I have this matrix here, then I can solve for AA. And algebraically, this is how it looks. So I have H equal to PS, and I have H sigma equal to PA sigma S. And therefore, I can use this P and S to try to cancel the P and S here and get AA. And the way to cancel them is using this uh, P plus and S plus, which are the moore penrose sendo inverse, which is a very convenient way to write something like solve this uh, linear system. Um, yeah, so yeah, maybe it's, it's, it's good to do a little bit of recap of what the moore penrose sedo inverse is. Uh, who's seen this before? Okay, just a few. So this is something from linear algebra, though it's not usually taught in like a basic linear algebra course. But it's something very useful. It's a generalization of the inverse for matrices that are not square, right? Matrices that are not square, they cannot have inverses. But sometimes we need to do things with matrices that are not square. And one way to generalize the inverse is the moore penrose sedo inverse, which for a matrix M that is N times M, uh, we usually write as M plus, and it's going to be like it's going to have transpose dimensions, M times N. And it satisfies a few properties. Uh, it satisfies these kind of uh, relations. Um, which, uh, I mean, it's, you can see like the things that like the, the, ident um, the normal inverse would satisfy anyway. Um, it kind of like cancels things uh, when the rungs are right. And it coincides with the inverse when the matrix is square. The most important property, the one that, that, that I'm going to use a lot here, is that you can use the pseudo inverse to solve uh, linear systems in the following sense. So if I have a system of linear equations m u equals b, if I compute the pseudo inverse of m, which is m plus, and I multiply by b, right? If, if, if m was square invertible, that would solve the system. If M is rectangular and like uh, M plus is this moore pern rosendo inverse, what you get from here is this kind of like the argmin of something of some argmin of something, uh, which like the interesting cases are summarized here. So if the system is completely determined, then basically uh, M plus B solves your system, right? There's only one, one solution and M plus B gives you that solution. Now, not all systems are completely determined. You can have underdetermined systems where there might be uh, more than one solution. So if that's the case, M plus B gives you the solution that has the smallest norm uh, in L2 sense, in, in, in like this uh, Euclidean norm. And you can have systems that have no solution, right? So if the system is overdetermined, then M plus B, well, you cannot get a solution, but it gives you, it gives you the minimal norm solution to the least squares problem, right? So you, if, if you have no solution, you can look for use that minimize this thing, right? If there's a solution, the minimum is zero. Otherwise, it's not going to be zero. So you'll have use that give you this minimum. But you, again, might have many use that give you this minimum. And M plus B gives you the minimum norm among those. OK, so that's a very convenient way, just M plus B, to solve like linear systems with very nice properties, depending on whether the system is completely determined, underdetermined, or overdetermined. 
Why am I saying that? Uh, well, I think it's a fun fact that it becomes very useful uh, quite often. But uh, I, I was just using some pseudo inverses here. And, and you actually need to justify that you, you get this thing back. And using the properties that I just sketched, you can justify this. But you can do something slightly better. You can show that you can do the same game even when you don't have the infinite Hankel matrix. Even when all you have are like finite sub-blocks of this Hankel matrix crafted in a particular way that satisfy certain assumptions. So what blocks will we be looking at? We'll be looking at finite Hankel sub-blocks that are usually indexed by a finite set of prefixes and a finite set of suffixes, right? And you just give me a set of rows and a set of columns. So in this case, uh, if the set of uh, rows is uh, AB, the orange ones, and the set of columns are, is uh, epsilon AB, then I can like, identify this red block here, right? Which is a, it's a sub-block of this Hankel matrix that I'm usually going to denote H. So I could put H, P, S to remind you what P, S are, but the notation gets really cumbersome. So I'll just write H. And there's another type of sub-block that we will also uh, need to use, which corresponds to this H sigma that I had also when I was doing this with infinite matrices, which is if you give me P and S, then I can concatenate the symbol sigma to all the prefixes in P and keep S as it is, and you get another sub-block. So if, for example, if you take the letter A and concatenate them to all these orange guys, so I get AA and BA, so these would be the purple uh, guys, and the, the S, the green uh, columns stay the same. So this block would correspond to this row here and this row here. Okay, and, and note that actually I did this in a way that they don't overlap, but H and H sigma could overlap, right? Because if I had like epsilon and A in P, then epsilon concatenated with A would give me A, and uh, for example, this would be in the red and, and the purple block. But because I don't know how to like write uh, like draw right on top of purple, I, I skip that thing in the in the example. So now that we know how to take like sub-blocks of a Hankel matrix, which is pretty intuitive, you just take a set of rows and a set of columns, and you need to know how to translate those by a given symbol uh, appended to all the prefixes, then you can go to one of these uh, kind of like basic building blocks or basic results of this theory, which tells you that if you have blocks of this form, Right? You have finite blocks of this Hankel matrix satisfying a particular assumptions, you can get the automaton back. And by that I mean I mean an automaton that computes the same function. Remember that these are things like they're they're like equivalent up to this rot rotation Q. So what are the assumptions? So suppose that you have a function that has rank n, meaning there's gonna exist a minimal weighted automaton uh, with n states that computes this function. And you have identified a set of prefixes and suffixes, uh, P and S, that both contain the empty string, okay, that's, that's important because otherwise you cannot get like the initial and final weights, and such that this uh, block that I gave you in the previous slide, indexed by P and S, of this infinite Hankel matrix has the same rank as the full matrix, right? So remember that, that this matrix has rank at most N, so actually you can show that when this is the case, you can, you can find blocks that are size n by n that have rank n. And, and this doesn't need to be n by n, this can be any, any blocks, but uh, you need to have this uh, full rank. Obviously, like, like any sub-block cannot have like rank bigger than n, because the matrix would have rank more than n, but uh, you need a, a sub-block that has full rank. So when that is the case, you can construct a weighted automaton that is going to compute this function by doing the following. So you take this finite sub-block and you compute a factorization, P and S, like I had before, right? And, and for this, in this case, you can use any rank factorization algorithm that you like, uh, QR, uh, Q, yeah, like a single body decomposition, Aiken decomposition, whatever you like. And because this matrix has rank N, you want a rank factorization, meaning that the intermediate dimension here must be n, and the rank of these two guys are, is going to be the rank of the full matrix, right? You can show that this uh, must be satisfied. So then what you do is you just take the first uh, row here. Probably uh, I can draw this. It makes more sense. 
So you have your h, which is indexed by prefixes and suffixes. And remember that you have the empty string in the prefixes and suffixes. And you just found this factorization, p and s, right? So here you have dimension n, here you have dimension n, here you have your empty string, here you have your empty string, and the other, uh, yeah, this, uh, these are calligraphic p and calligraphic s. So these are going to be your initial weights. These are going to be your final weights. And then I'm going to use the same formula that I had before with the pseudo inverse, uh, this, but this time with finite matrices. So I'm going to take the, the A sigma to be P pseudo inverse times H sigma, which is a translation of this guy by adding like sigma to all the prefixes in P, uh, times S plus. So I claim that what you get is a minimal weighted automaton that computes F. And to prove this, uh, I don't need to do much. I just need to show it computes F because it has n states, so it's going to be minimal by, by assumption. So this has a relatively easy proof. What do you do? Well, you know F is rational uh, and, and admits a weighted automaton with uh, a minimal weighted automaton with n states. So let's suppose A tilde is such an automaton. If I can show that A the A that is constructed by this algorithm and the A tilde uh, are related by a Q, right? Then they compute the same function and I'm done. So how do you do this? Uh, well, I showed you also that if you have an A tilde, this induces a factorization of your like full Hankel matrix that I can also take as a, as a factorization of any subblock, right? So using A tilde, I built a factorization of H, which is the subblock, that is going to be P tilde, S tilde. And similarly, I have a factorization for H sigma that is P tilde, A sigma tilde, S tilde. So then, what, what, how, what did the algorithm do? The algorithm let A sigma be P pseudo inverse, H sigma as, uh, as pseudo inverse. So I plug this thing in there, right? So I expand the H sigma like this in here. So I get P pseudo inverse P tilde, the A tilde as uh, tilde S plus. So that basically tells me that if I'm looking for something that has this form, maybe the Q should be as S plus. And then you go and check that this is the case using some of the properties of pseudo inverse. You show that this guy satisfies uh, what it must satisfy and that its inverse is actually P plus P tilde. I think this is the trickiest calculation which is here. And you're done. So by just factorizing the Hankel matrix uh, of, uh, of something that could be computed by a weighted automaton, I got back one weighted automaton that is equivalent to the one that I had before. So now, if we want to design learning algorithms based on this, uh, what we will need to do is like, well, find out what's the right Hankel matrix, estimate it, and then apply this reconstruction algorithm, but being a bit careful, because here I assume that I had the exact Hankel matrix and the exact rank and so on, and when you do this from data, you'll have some noise, so you'll have to account for noise and you'll have to see whether you can make this algorithm robust to perturbations. Okay, so this is just like a, a, a diagram of what I just said. How do these uh, learning algorithms work that are based on, on what we call the Hankel trick? We take data, we estimate the Hankel matrix and we get a weighted automaton back. So, uh, well, this sounds like very straightforward. Obviously, when you go into the details, like it, it can get tricky. So, so what I'll do in the rest of the talk is basically like iterate uh, this diagram like several times and show you how you use this paradigm in different settings. In different settings are going to mean essentially different depending on the type of data that you have. So, for example, sometimes we're trying to learn stochastic automata, so automata that, are, that compute probability distributions. In this case, it turns out that most of the times estimating the Hankel matrix is just some counting. So you count like how many things you have observed things in the data, put it in the Hankel matrix, get uh, an automaton that, that computes these probabilities back from the matrix. Uh, in more general cases, you'll have to do something like related to statistical learning theory, like empirical risk minimization. Um, obviously, when you design these algorithms, we know that the rank of the matrix is going to be related to the number of stages of the weighted automaton. So if we want to prevent overfitting, if we want to ensure that there's going to be generalization, 
we would like these matrices to have low rank, so we'll need to find a way to enforce low rank in, in, in this uh, building of the Hankel matrices. And obviously, whenever we do that, we want to work with finite Hankel matrices, so we'll have some parameters that are going to be the rows and columns of the Hankel subblock that we're looking at. That typically is something that you have to choose depending on, well, a bit of knowledge of your application and so on. And once we have the Hankel matrix, we'll just apply this algorithm that I showed you, but uh, we must make sure that we can make this robust to noise, okay? Um, so how do we measure this robustness to noise? By the way, any questions so far? Things are going to get slightly technical now. But don't worry, I think it's like the, the top of the technical and then it goes back down again. Um, okay, so now we want to make these algorithms robust to noise. So we need to talk about approximations. We need to talk about approximations of like the, these functions f, and we need to talk about approximations about this automata. So, uh, well, approximations and norms are some things that go hand in hand. So let's try to define some norms on, to begin with, weighted automata. So if I have a weighted automaton and I have a pair of numbers, p and q, between one and infinity, that are holder conjugate, meaning that they satisfy this identity, then you can define a pq norm uh, of a weighted automaton a which is going to be the maximum of the p norm of the initial weights, the q norm of the final weights, and the maximum of the q norms of the transition uh, matrices. Where here, this q norm is the induced q norm, meaning that the, q, the induced q norm on a matrix is the supremum over, if I take all vectors that have q norm at most one, of the q norm of the vector applied to the, to the matrix. Okay, and, and you will see why this is kind of a, a good definition. I mean, you, you could come up with many, many ways to measure the, the, say, the size of a weighted automaton. Here I'm measuring the size of the weights in a way that is going to be compatible with the, the tools that I want to use to derive these bounds. But this is not so unnatural. So, for example, if you have a probabilistic automaton, so that these guys are probabilities, these guys are like, like initial probabilities, stopping probabilities, and transition probabilities, um, then you can show, for example, that if you take p equals 1 and q equals infinity, this norm is exactly 1. So you, ha you, you have like settings of p and q that play nice uh, with like some restrictions that are more semantic on what the automaton does, right? So it's, it's not a completely arbitrary way of defining a norm. So I introduced these norms because I want to talk about approximations and I'll, I'll give you two approximation results. Uh, this is where things get slightly technical. But these approximation results uh, will help me like, motivate why these algorithms that we're going to derive are going to be robust to noise. So the first approximation result is about the following problem. Suppose you have two weighted automata A and A prime, both with the same number of states N. And now, well, assume that like, both the, the PQ norms of these two automata are bounded by some constant rho. But also importantly, assume that uh, kind of the distance between these two automata with respect to that norm that I defined, which is the maximum between the, the distance or between the initial weights in P norm, the distance of the final weights in Q norm, and the distance between the transition weights in induced Q norm. Suppose that this uh, thing is bounded by delta, right? So I, I have two automata. <clears throat> if this delta is small, what I have is like they're kind of close to each other. The weights are not too far apart from each other. And what I would like to say is that, well, if the weights are not too different, the languages that they compute are not too different, right? So there's many ways to do this. The one that I'm doing here is the one that fits in one slide, meaning that is, is obviously not the most sophisticated one and not the one that gives you the tightest bounds, but all this is supposed to do is give you the intuition of, of that we can actually prove these sort of things. If the weights are close, the languages are close. Okay, so here's the statement. Uh, for any string x, the function computed by a on x and the function computed by a prime on x differ by at most the length of x plus 2 times uh, rho to the power of x plus 1 times delta. Okay? So uh, this can be a bit unsettling at first, the fact that this bound grows with the length of the string. In fact, it is. 
But remember, for example, that I told you that if I take p equals 1 and q equals infinity, and I have a probabilistic automaton, I can put a 1 here, which would make this guy go away. So you get rid of the dependence on x if your kind of like weights are controlled. If you have something that, as I give, uh, longer strings don't grow, uh, like the weights don't grow too much, which is what happens with the probabilities, for example. The next thing is that if you make delta small, this bound becomes smaller. So that's kind of like the, the, the good uh, thing to happen here. It's kind of a continuity property. Uh, so how do you prove this? Uh, you prove this by induction on the length of x. So remember that uh, what I have here is like you know, the initial weights of A times the transition weights times the final weights, and the same here. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to bound the difference between the transition weights with respect to the Q-norm. And I claim that this is bounded by the length of x times this factor that uh, is almost like this, but with a, with a plus 1 instead of a minus 1, and the delta. And you do this by induction. So if, if the length of x is 0, there's nothing to do, right? You have two identities. So the difference is going to be 0. So the bound is uh, obviously satisfied. Um, so what if I have a string that is x concatenated with sigma? Well, what I do is basically I, I'm going to add and subtract here something that is going to be uh, ax prime. Yeah, probably it's easy if I write this. So the first step, what it's doing is I'm adding and subtracting something that is a cross cross thing between the two automaton, right? The transition weights with respect to the prime automaton on x times the transition weights on sigma of the other automaton. And then I can apply triangle inequality and some multiplicativity of these norms to get this thing here, right? So multiplicativity basically means that if I have like a product of two matrices, uh, their norm is bounded by the product of the norms. These, these, these induced norms always satisfy this. And then, well, this is what I'm, I'm bounding by induction. Uh, this is what I can bound by rho. Uh, this, again, I can bound by rho to the x. And this is, again, my assumption. So you get this bound that uh, you want it. And, and then you, you, you do the full thing, which is, again, like applying tricks like this of like uh, you take these two guys and you add and subtract uh, alpha a prime beta prime, so a cross of like between the two automata, and you apply triangle inequality and so on and so forth. At some point, you have to apply holder inequality, which is uh, essentially here, right? So if I have, uh, yeah, let's remind holder inequality. So the second trick is holder, which basically says that if you have something uh, of the form, so you have an inner product, something alpha transpose beta, and you have p and q that are conjugate, you can always upper bound this by the p norm of q, uh, the p norm of alpha times the q norm of beta, which is what I'm applying here. Okay, so basically that's all you need to get this proof, like a little bit of algebra, but like, well, the plus minus trick, which we all know, uh, holders inequality and some multiplicativity of these norms, and you get this bound. And as I said, you can get more fancy things. So for example, if you make further assumptions on your automaton, and instead of trying to bound things for a single string, you try to bound things, for example, for the sum of this thing over all strings of a fixed length, you can get like cute telescoping arguments that give you like, like nice cancellations and so on, but it doesn't fit in one slide. Uh, you, you can, for example, you can look this up in my PhD if you're interested. Okay, so we know now that if you change the weights of the automaton a little bit, the language is not going to change too much. So that's a good thing. That means that now if we want to come up with these learning algorithms to like learn a particular automaton, as long as we can make um, this, um, this reconstruction of the automaton robust to noise so that I get uh, weights that are close to what I, I was supposed to get, then I'll get a good language if my target is to learn the language. So how do we do this second step? Uh, the second step will require making this algorithm that I told you that takes a Hankel matrix and recovers a weighted automaton robust to noise. And the way to make it robust to noise, remember that that, that algorithm had a particular uh, 
So it has a rank factorization here. So what you need to do is pick a fa rank factorization that's going to be robust to noise. I mean, it's pretty intuitive. Um, so this uh, decomposition is the single value decomposition. Uh, have you seen this before? Have you seen this before? OK, yeah, roughly the same people that have seen the, the pseudo inverse because they're pretty related. Um, so any matrix has a singular value decomposition. Again, this is kind of in, in the same way that some matrices have like Eigen decompositions. Uh, all matrices have singular value decompositions. So if the matrix is n times m and has rank k, what you have is a factorization of this form. So you're writing m as u db transpose, um, where d, so, so the, the intermediate dimensions here are the rank of the matrix, so they're k. d is diagonal, it's k times k, and, and it's diagonal, it contains this, uh, the singular values, which are k numbers that are non-negative and that are actually sorted in the diagonal. And then u and b contain what are called singular vectors. Okay, so, so these are like ortho, orthonormal matrices. So u transpose u's identity and b transpose b's identity. And u contains k left singular vectors which have dimension n, and b contains k right singular vectors which have dimension m. And another way to write this is to basically say that you can write m as the sum for i equals one to k, of these rank one matrices that you obtain by, by multiplying the left singular matrix with a singular vector with the right singular vector. So these are like rank one matrices scaled by, by the singular value. So in that algorithm that I, that I showed you to get from a Hankel matrix to an automaton, you needed to uh, pick rank factorization uh, SVD gives you several rank factorizations. One that is kind of convenient uh, is this one. I'm not sure if I'm using this one in subsequent slides, maybe a different one. But anyway, if you partition here or here or the D in the middle, like in here, you get rank factorizations, which gives you like this, this factorization of a P and a Q if you put a Hankel matrix here that you can use in the algorithm. Uh, as I said, this is related to the pseudo inverse. So if you know M, you can. If you know the SVD of M, you can compute the pseudo inverse M plus by just like moving this matrix to the other side, this to the other side with some transposition and inverting D. So this is very, very easy uh, because inverting D, because it's diagonal, is just like I'm taking one over the similar values. So this is kind of the simplest way to compute the pseudo inverse. And this is robust to noise. This factorization is robust to noise. Um, and one way to see this is that this thing provides optimal low rank approximations in the following sense. So if you have a matrix that has rank k, k might be large because, for example, uh, this matrix M might be like a low rank matrix plus noise. And you give me some k prime that is smaller than k, right? <clears throat> you can find a matrix M k prime that is going to have rank k prime and that is going to be the best rank uh, the best k prime rank approximation to m. And the way to do this is very simple. You just take this sum and you truncate it to k prime, right? You just like discard the last uh, k minus k prime uh, singular values and singular vectors. Forget about them. So this is, is the property stated formally. It basically says that this m k prime that I just built is a minimizer for the problem of finding, like looking at all the matrices of rank at most k prime, that and minimize the approximation uh, with respect to m in operator norm, and actually the same thing is, is satisfied if you put here a Frobenius norm instead of an operator norm. And this operator norm, by the way, is the induced to norm that we've been using uh, all along. Okay. So here's the other technical stuff. Um, this is how we do the second part of the approximation. Uh, we show that if we have a good approximation of the Hankel matrix, we can get a good approximation of the target automaton, right? And we'll, the weights will be close, and by the previous result, also the languages will be close. So how do we do this? Well, we take these are the same assumptions that I had in, in my previous uh, algorithm and, and the previous slide of like how you go from a Hankel matrix to, a, uh, to an automaton. 
And this is like a reinstantiation of that algorithm where instead of putting here any rank factorization here, I'm making very specific that I want an SBD, right? And I'm taking the rank factorization coming from the SBD that I had in the previous slide. And now we are going to build another automaton coming from a noisy Hankel matrix or noisy Hankel subblocks, right? So suppose that uh, in addition to H on PS, I have some H hat again on PS, and in addition to this uh, H sigma here on P sigma S, I have some H hat uh, of the same dimensions again, and that these uh, differences, like the differences in norms between H and H hat and H hat sigma and H hat sigma for all the sigmas, all these differences are bounded by, by delta with respect to, the, for example, the operator norm. But the, the, the particular norm is not that important here. The fact is that the, the true Hankel matrix and this approximated Hankel matrix are close. So now, obviously, what happens is that this matrix might not have rank n anymore, right? This is some uh, matrix of rank n plus some noise, where the noise is, is basically this difference. So uh, if I run this algorithm like verbatim, I'll end up with an automaton that's going to have like the number of states of the rank here, which usually if you have a low rank matrix and you add noise, you get like much higher ranks. So you'll get an automaton that is too big. So you have to modify the algorithm slightly so it gives you an, uh, an automaton of size n. And the way to do it is by using this property that SBD like give, can give you like low rank, optimal low rank approximations. So now I take this matrix and I compute the optimal rank n approximation using the SBD, right? Which is going to give me this P hat times S hat, which now is not going to be equal to H hat. It's going to be an approximation to it that's going to satisfy this thing that I had in the previous slide. And, but now what I do is just like, is, is symbol pushing, like blind algebra. I take this P hat and this S hat and do the same thing that I would do here. So I take like, alpha hat and beta hat to be like the first row and the first column of these guys. And then I solve for A sigma hat by like multiplying the H sigma hat by P hat in the left the pseudo inverse and S hat in pseudo inverse on the right. And then you can show, and this definitely doesn't fit in one slide. Uh, so uh, this is one of the, of the, well, this is probably the most important result that I'm not going to prove, which is that if you have any pair of uh, Holder conjugates, P and Q, then you can show that the bound here is big O of delta. And this big O hides a lot of constants, constants that might depend on, well, on, on the dimension, on the size of these guys, uh, constants that will depend on things like uh, the singular values of H, and, and many other things, but the important thing, right, the, the, the conceptually important thing is that if H gets closer to H hat, right, this, if this delta gets small, this thing gets small, right? So if I have a better approximation of the Hankel matrix, I get a better approximation of the weights of the automaton, kind of like intuitive. Uh, and these are like the results that we use to build like learning algorithms for weighted automaton. Yeah. Yes, that would be a, a parameter, yeah. So if, if you would get this slightly wrong, then does it still hold? Probably, but... uh, you could hope to prove like approximate things. So you could hope to prove, for example, if you run this thing with, say, a, n minus 1, and here you run this thing with n minus 1, right? So instead of doing a full SBD, you do a, a rank n minus 1 SBD. You can also prove approximations in there. Uh, so, yeah, you, you can prove approximation results of this type. In practice, uh, what happens also is that you can tune this by kind, kind of cross-validation, right? You try several parameters and you look which one performs best on your data. Okay, so... Questions, maybe? No, it's not time for a break yet. Okay, so let's briefly recap what we've done so far. Um, we've seen that if we want to represent um, sequential, like functions on sequential data in a finite, in a compact way, we can use weighted automata. 
weighted automata are very related to Hankel matrices and there's a way to go from Hankel matrices or sublogs of them to back to the automaton. Uh, we hope that we can estimate these, these matrices from data and if we do this and there's a little bit of noise, we know that these reconstruction algorithms will kind of be tolerant to this noise, so this noise will be propagated through our approximations greatly. So now, all that is left to do, in a sense, is how do we estimate these Hankel matrices in such a way that there's a small noise as we get more and more data. And this is what I'm going to do in these two sections in two different settings. So the PAC setting, you know, the computational learning setting that you saw in Ben's lecture, and the statistical learning setting, which is kind of the non-realizable case uh, that you saw in Barun's lecture. Okay. So the first setting uh, is, is interesting because if, so if Ben told you about pack learning, and in pack learning, usually you're trying to learn, for example, a concept or a function that will assign some y's to some x's. And you have these pairs of uh, x's uh, drawn from some distribution, and the labels y are produced by some object that you're trying to learn. So that means that when you do usual pack learning, you have two things that are going on. You have the f and you have the distribution. And, and for automata, this is kind of bad because these results, these negative results that I showed you at the beginning, basically like the way you prove these things is to show that, well, like no matter which automaton you pick, I can always find a bad distribution that will give you examples that won't give you enough information for you to learn properly. So the way you can go around this is by trying to learn distributions computed by automaton, in which case what you're trying to learn and the distribution generating the data are the same thing. So there's no room for an adversary to pick you in a, a distribution that is going to try to fool you. So this is how uh, some of the results that I said like work in particular cases manage to prove like learning results that are kind of like uh, efficient like in, in the sample complexity sense and in the computational sense by like removing this dissociation between where you sample from and what you're trying to learn. So here, this is the, the type of results that I'm going to prove are about learning uh, probability distributions on strings that are computed by weighted automaton or like types of weighted automata. And usually when you talk about this, you, well, you say, well, I have a function from strings to real numbers that computes probabilities. So there are going to be numbers between zero and one. And there's a few settings you can consider the two Typical settings are when this f is a stochastic language, meaning it is a probability distribution over all strings. So when you sum f of x over all x, you sum up to one. And in this case, what you can assume is that you can sample strings from this distribution and use this as your data. Uh, something that is slightly different that also appears in applications are dynamical systems. So in dynamical systems, uh, you, will, you could potentially like generate a string of infinite length because it's a system that evolves over time and keeps going until somebody stops it. But, but we're not trying to model the stopping time here. So then in this case, what you have is that f gives you a probability distribution over uh, a strings of fixed length, right? So for any t bigger than zero, if you sum over all strings of length t, then you get a distribution but you have a distribution for each t. So that means that I can sample like a prefix and, I, uh, and then I can sample further symbols, like the process doesn't stop. Uh, so this is more common in say like natural language processing and this is more common in say reinforcement learning or robotics and like time series analysis and so on. And what I'm gonna show uh, basically results that, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make them like specific for this case, but you can extend every last one of them to this case with just minor tweaks. So it's, it's kind of fine. Okay, so how do we estimate the Hankel matrix from this type of data? Uh, the first thing that you can do is, is, is completely obvious. So if you give me a sample x1 up to xm that contains m strings, that are sampled iid from some like a stochastic language, there's a uh, an f that is a probability distribution over sigma star, well, uh, if what I can do is uh, I pick like a set of prefixes and suffixes, right? And I estimate the Hankel block 
that on prefix p and suffix s is going to give me like some approximate function computed on the sample uh, of like well concatenating p and s and how does this approximation on the sample goes was well, just an empirical count right so if i look at string x then i can see like how many times x appears in my data and uh, normalized by m right that's the, the 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 empirical frequency of the string x in the sample s uh, so this is kind of straightforward. It's very easy to show that this is kind of unbiased and, and consistent. So if I get more and more data, I will converge to the true H. This is a block of the Hankel matrix, which is the expectation of this thing over like sampling from the distribution. <clears throat> but uh, depending on how you choose the prefixes and suffixes of your Hankel matrix, this can be data inefficient. So what I mean by that is that if I take P and S that are too small, I'm going to ignore some data in my sample. Oh, oh! I thought there was like something that turns these things red. Um, so here, for example, right? So if you have this, this Hankel matrix here, uh, for example, this string doesn't appear in here. So when I do my counts, it will be ignored. The same happens for this string, and the same happens for this string, and the same happens for many other of them, but I cannot eyeball it. Um, so that's kind of unsatisfactory. <laughs> What could you do? You could take like a bigger set of prefixes and suffixes, right? But, but that also might not be that satisfactory because like there's a trade-off between ignoring data and putting entries in this matrix that you have estimated from too little data, right? So if, if I like grow uh, this set of prefixes and suffixes very big, obviously at some point I'll have a bunch of zeros. But are these zeros because the distribution uh, doesn't like produce anything in there? Or are these zeros because I didn't have enough data to look at like longer prefixes and suffixes, right? Because it might be that you know, the, the probability of generating strings of a certain length decreases with the length. So unless I get more samples, I will never get to see these, these probabilities. And I'll be putting like zeros in my matrix that shouldn't be zeros, right? So you will be introducing more noise into your matrix or you will be ignoring data. And we want to find like a solution around this. What would happen if uh, all the zeros you kind of interpolate from the neighborhood? Um, well, it's not clear what, what the neighborhood uh, would be in this case. I mean, you can do lots of things. Like, like, like uh, I'm just like serving the basic method here and people have done a lot of things. So you could also like say, well, I'm gonna like kind of label this thing together with its with the variance that I estimate or like the uncertainty that I have in there and then try to come up with like say more uh, I don't know more fancy decomposition methods that can take these uh, uncertainties into account you can do lots of things what I'm going to show you are the things that kind of play well with the automaton representation that we are assuming for this f that we're trying to learn one of them is saying, oh, so I'm estimating these counts from full sequences, right? And that's why, for example, I'm ignoring this thing. But if instead of estimating this from the full string, I was just estimating it for a prefix, well, then, for example, this string has prefix AA, so AA would appear here. So is there a way that I, instead of putting here something that depends on me observing the string AA and nothing else, depends, me, depends on observing the prefix AA? And, and that's what, what you can do when you're estimating this thing from prefixes, which is one way to make this slightly more data efficient. So under the same assumption, under the same time of sample, now instead of an A F hat that I had before, I'm going to come up with an F bar. And this F bar on an input string X is going to compute the number of times that X appeared as a prefix in my sample, right? So now I will not be ignoring, uh, I will be ignoring less strings. And you can actually show that if your F is computed by an automaton, uh, then this thing also gives you statistics about the automaton, right? About this, this stochastic automaton that generates this distribution. And the way to do this is basically first you compute the expectation of this guy. And what it happens is the expectation of this guy is basically the sum over all suffixes of f on x, y, which is the probability under this distribution f of generating a string that starts with x. That's kind of like 
straightforward that these are what I'm, I'm counting like strings that begin with X, so I get the probability of like a string that begins with X. But the nice thing is that if this thing is computed by a probabilistic, well, like a, a, a weighted automaton, in this case we call it usually a stochastic automaton because it defines a stochastic language, this expression here, if you expand it in terms of the automaton, you can get, you can show that this counts here that you're getting are uh, come from a related automaton and that's how you do it so you take well this probability of generating a string that begins by x is the sum over all suffixes of f x times the suffix i expand this in terms of the automaton so that's like initial weights transition weights for x transition weights for y and beta i put the summation of y inside so i have this part that depends on x and i have this summation and then you do this summation and you can show that if you're summing over all uh, strings, y, this is actually the same thing as summing for all lengths, uh, the sum of like the matrices for all possible symbols to the power t. Uh, I rewrite this as a basically, so I get this sum of a, a to the t times beta for all t is non-zero. And in the same way that, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you all know this, but in the same way that if you have sum of rho for say t bigger than zero t this is one over one minus rho if this thing converges uh, then if this thing converges this sum of a to the t is well one minus a inverse right which is the same thing as, as the rho there and so nicely you can say well now this count that i'm estimating come from a different automaton that has alpha as its initial weights which are the the same initial weights that i had before I can recover from it the same transition ways that I'm interested in, so that's also fine. And then all I did was change the final weights. Instead of like the original final weights beta of, my, of the automaton that I'm trying to learn, I have a B bar here that is related to, to the original weights by this thing. And from, for example, if I learn the A, the A sigmas, I can compute this thing because this is just the sum of the A sigmas. So you, from this uh, kind of counts that look at your sample uh, more thoroughly, so to speak, you can actually get back the automaton that you're interested in. Um, now you're going to say, this is still data inefficient because if I have like very long strings in my data and I'm only looking at the prefixes, well, I'm, I'm, I might be looking at all the strings, but I only look at the finite piece of each string. And this makes this thing still uh, some data inefficient. And, and you're right. And we can do something even better. Instead of looking at prefixes, we can look at substrings. This gets slightly more tricky. Um, so maybe after this uh, will be time for a break. Uh, it's just like, I don't know, like an incentive to hold with me for the next five minutes. Uh, so how do we do this thing over substrings? So again, you give me a sample, and now the hunk of matrix that I'm going to estimate, if I have a string x that is p times s, what I'm going to put in there, I think I now denote f tilde. These are like things to, to distinguish them. So now it's going to be a count, right? So I'm going to like average over all strings in my sample this uh, x i sub uh, bar x, which basic, by that I basically mean the number of times that x appears as a substring, like contiguous sequence of, sequ uh, sequence of symbols, in my x i, which I can write using this indicator uh, variable notation, right? So now I'm definitely looking at all of my sample uh, for each x that index is an index in my Hankel matrix, I'm going through all the strings in my sample and counting how many times, on average, this x appears as a substring in my sample. So there's no using the data more than this. And the good thing is that, again, you can play the same trick and show that this comes from a transformation of your original automaton. So you're actually learning something that is related to your automaton that makes sense. It's not like just some bogus counting. Uh, because you could do other things. You could try instead, for example, of counting the number of, of times that something appears as a substring, you could try to count the number of uh, times um, the frequency of x appearing as a substring somewhere, not how many times. This other one, which is kind of similar to, to the number of times that you appear as a substring, is not related to the automaton at all. 
So, so that's something that you need to be a bit careful when, when, when you do these derivations. And again, you can show that, well, when you take the expectation of this, uh, well, you get what you expect. So you get the expected number of uh, times that x appears as a substring when you draw some y from the sample, which you can rewrite like this, basically, right? Like the number of times that y appears as, uh, that x appears as a subsample of y times the probability that you sample y. And using this representation, you can again uh, like derive this from like your original weighted automata that generated the samples, where now you have to sum over like some prefixes and some suffixes at the same time. So instead of just a beta bar, you get an alpha bar and a beta bar. Okay. So this is um, the, the the most efficient way when you're doing we when you're dealing with several uh, MMID. Uh, IID strings to obtain a Hankel matrix that uh, represents your data to then learn the automaton. And if you're really interested in the initial and final weights, then you can do like uh, invert these transformations. But before the break, I just want to do one last thing, which is remember that I told you that you can have distributions over strings or you can have these dynamical systems that will never stop. So when you have this dynamical system that never stops, it might be that you don't have access to several trajectories of your, of your dynamical system. It might be that you just have access to one very long trajectory of your dynamical system. Again, what you can do here in practice is come up with all sorts of heuristics that say, well, I'm going to chop my trajectory into pieces somewhere uh, so that they become independent samples and so on and do some heuristics. But you can actually do also something principled here, which is uh, estimate Hankel matrix from a single string when you have this like very long string. And how you, do you do this? Well, again, you're going to have this like thing that you're going to put in your, in your Hankel matrix at index x. Uh, that's going to depend on m. That is how long, like, how long your trajectory has been going on. And that is going to count how many times x has appeared in your trajectory, right? It's, it's pretty intuitive. Um, what happens again is that you can show that if this dynamical system is computed by some uh, weighted automaton, you can again do the calculations and show that these things you're estimating, their expectation, so by the way, this is called like a Chesser average, uh, like average over time instead of like across uh, samples. You can show that these Chesser averages are also related to your weighted automaton. And um, I don't want to inflict your, this like more algebra on you, Basically, what happens is, again, you have like the beta stay the same, the transition weights stay the same, and then you have an initial weight that depends on how many samples you have observed uh, in expectation. And actually, if, if what you're dealing with has real, really like some sort of probabilistic interpretation, uh, like this is a probabilistic system or an HMM or a probabilistic automaton without like stopping probabilities, you can show that this actually converges to some sort of stationary distribution. Uh, so in, in most of the cases you can imagine, we can get uh, estimations of the Hankel matrix uh, that have like the, the right expectations, so they're unbiased, they're consistent. And the question is, how do we show that what you're getting from a certain number of samples is a good approximation of the Hankel matrix of what you're trying to learn so that then we can invoke all these uh, robustness to noise results. And that's what we'll discuss first after the break.